please do join me in Genesis chapter 4. Genesis 4, it should be on page 4 of uh, the blue ESV Bible in the seat backs out there if you're using that. Um, we're going to be looking at verses 17 through 26. We're going to finish chapter 4 today. Uh, the title of our sermon is Like Father, Like Son. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio stars as uh, Dom, Dom Cobb in Christopher Nolan's 2010 film Inception. Um, I only saw it once, and so this is a summary I read. Um, I believe he's a thief. Uh, Cobb is a thief with the rare ability to enter people's dreams and steal their secrets from their subconscious or something like that. Uh, overall, though, it's a world where dreams can be manipulated and shared, and it's a wild, complex, thrilling tale of dreams within dreams. Well, Genesis is sort of the inception of the Bible. Uh, I said a few weeks ago that Genesis 3.24 marks the end of the introduction to the book of Genesis. And in a manner of speaking, that is certainly true. Genesis 1 to 3 sets up all the major theological themes that we find in the rest of the Bible. Today, however, we come to the end of what you could call the first major section, uh, first major structural section of the book of Genesis. Structurally, uh, the introduction to the book is something more like Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3. And then Genesis 2, 4 through 4, 26 is the first major section of the book. Uh, and to see this, you just need to recall that Genesis is organized by the repetition of, certain, of a certain phrase throughout its 50 chapters. And this first phrase occurs in 2, 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth. And it introduces a section of scripture that extends all the way to uh, the end of our passage today in 426. And so next week, Lord willing, we will take up uh, the second and much, or really we'll take up the beginning of the second and much briefer uh, major section of Genesis in 5.1. This is the book of the generations of Adam, which ends in 6.7, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And so that's where we're heading very soon. But up till this point, we've been asking this question, what became of the heavens and the earth? that God created those many years ago. Well, we've seen that despite having been formed and filled and given light by God himself, the heavens and the earth um, were brought to ruin and decay and darkness through the acts of the primordial guardians of the world by their rebellion against God at the tree of wisdom in the garden of Eden, God's holy sanctuary. God had charged his image bearers to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill the earth, and to bring it into complete order and subjection as his vice regents. He had set man as a priest in the garden, temple, sanctuary, to guard the space from possible intrusion and defilement. But then things descend quickly into chaos as the Lord, little l, Adam is conquered by the dragon and disobeys the Lord, Big L, by eating from the tree of which he was commanded not to eat. Humanity's covenant Lord, Yahweh, then renders judgment and brings the curse of the covenant down upon the covenant breakers, resulting in conflict, toil, exile, and all of it culminating, it would be in their deaths. And yet, God also mixes his judgment with mercy. He promises an offspring who would bring about humanity's salvation, who would rescue them from the serpent and his wicked horde, that he would crush his head despite receiving an injury himself. And then Genesis 4, which we saw last week, tells us what happened next. And we see that despite the faith and the hope of the man and the woman in Yahweh's promise of this coming seed, the, their first child, through his own unbelief in the promise of God, murdered his brother Abel in a jealous rage. And despite Cain's conviction for the murder of his brother, the Lord doesn't 
execute him on the spot, but he exiles him to be a fugitive wanderer on the earth, and he even places a mark of protection upon him to prevent the rapid escalation of violence and shedding of blood in the world as vengeance upon vengeance would be likely taken. And so today we see the growth and the development of civilization through Cain's descendants on the one hand, and we see the Lord's answer to the principal problem that had been created by Abel's death at his brother's hands. And so I want to read these verses with you now, uh, give a very brief outline, and then we'll get to work on it. Verse 17, Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad fathered Mahujael, and Mahujael fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Zillah bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Naamah. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So there are really just two parts to this sermon this morning. Uh, the first is a bit lengthier than the second. Uh, first, in verses 17 to 24, we need to see the false start of sorts to Adam's genealogy through Cain to the seventh generation. So we're going to see the genealogy of Adam through Cain to the seventh generation. And then in verses 25 and 26, we will see God's appointment of another seed in the place of murdered Abel. Well, look with me in the first place is verses 17 to 24, where we see Adam's genealogy through Cain. Verse 17 tells us that Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore a son, Enoch. Who is his wife? Well, as uncomfortable as it is for us perhaps to say today, uh, she would have been the daughter of Adam and Eve, his sister, um, of course, as history progresses and humanity expands and sin through humanity corrupts, there comes a, a quite important point and purpose to restricting marriage to members uh, who are outside of one's immediate family. But at this time in history, that was really neither required nor even an option if humanity was to exist at all. And so Cain... We saw last week, exiled from Eden, he settles in the land of, of Nod, uh, and he works to build a, a city which he names after his son. Enoch's name means something like initiated, and, and so Cain is initiating a, a new beginning for himself, and, uh, and very possibly in, in contradiction even to the Lord's command and curse upon him to be a fugitive wanderer. And so he, he founds this city, uh, naming it after his son in this new beginning that he has uh, still somewhat, perhaps we might say, in rebellion against God. And, and it's certainly clear that whatever his precise mentality was in founding the city, uh, things do not improve much as we look through his the next several generations. And we're given the next four. We have Enoch, who fathers Ired. Ired fathers Mahujael. Mahujael fathers Methushael. And Methushael fathers Lamech, where we, where we stop. Now, I know what you're thinking. 
genealogies are my favorite part of the Bible. And I can't wait for more of this. Okay, that might not be true. But I do want to take a moment here and, and reflect about genealogies. Because we're going to kind of see a lot of them as we go through Genesis. And, and we're, we're warming up here, right? This is pretty tame and easy. But genealogies are not wasted space. Right? The authors had limited space of the Bible, and so when they're included, we need to see them as significant. And in fact, as we work through Genesis, the unavoidable conclusion to draw about genealogies, at least the ones in Genesis, is that they are very important to the Lord. It's worth asking why. Well, Genesis is, among other things, history. Genealogies testify to the history historicity of these events. In other words, they proclaim that these are real people with real lives. They're real fathers and mothers. They have real children. Real children with real parents and real siblings. You know, they had, they had thoughts and feelings and wills just like we do. I, it's easy, I think, when we read about events from a long time ago to forget that these are real people we're talking about, that they merely become a, a literary point, um, a literary feature, uh, and, uh, and, and so we just always ask the question, well, how did, what does this have to do with me? Who cares what they thought? What does it mean for me? But Cain was a real person who really missed this huge opportunity in his life through unbelief, who really rejected God, who really murdered his brother, who really was exiled. Enoch, his son, was a real person. His son, I read, a real person. Mahujael, Methushael, Lamech, horrifyingly, real people that really existed. But genealogies also, in that line of thought, they call forth from us humility. Right? Because these, these men died. They lived and died. And most of them, most of the people in any genealogy you read in Scripture, most of them have their name mentioned. Maybe how long they lived. And that's it. Some of them, very few of them, have anything mentioned about who they were or what they did. These people often are only mentioned in these genealogies because they either preceded or succeeded someone of significance. We don't know anything about them other than who their important grandfather or grandson was. And so it will be for us. Right, the vast, vast majority of us in this room, nothing more than a name and a list of descendants or ancestors of some other important person will remain and be left in a very short order. Right, so when we read, when we come to these genealogies, and especially we'll see this uh, in chapter five, uh, an important point to be made here is we need to come to these genealogies with humility. Perhaps not take ourselves quite as seriously as we might otherwise be tempted. And so whatever desires for greatness, personal greatness that you might have, or greatness of your family, please remember that most of your efforts, most of my efforts, most of our efforts will go completely unnoticed by most people on earth. In just a few years' time, those who do notice them will forget them or be dead themselves. Really encouraging, I know. But this is why the later biblical writers encourage us to pray, to work, and to give ultimately to and for the Lord since he alone sees and remembers all things. So I'm not telling you to live apathetically, but to live humbly. 
and to work vigorously, not for the praise and the con commendation of man, but for the praise and commendation of God. One more thing about genealogies in general before we look at this one. Uh, all genealogies that we encounter in the Bible draw us back to the promise of the seed in Genesis 3.15. The promise of the conflict between the two seeds, the seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent, the conquering seed of the woman, all, all of these genealogies at some level have that as an echo to them, right? The constant refrain of so-and-so fathered so-and-so, it renders the reality of war and the, the hope of victory an ever-present reality. It's real, but it, all, it doesn't always, we forget that sometimes. And so when you come to a genealogy in Genesis, at some level you begin the genealogy by asking, is, is this the one? That's not easy for us to do since we realize how much more of the Bible there is, but think about for the Israelites what that would have been as they read of these stories. How, how does this one factor into that? Where is the one, and especially for the, those experiencing these things in real time, is this the one who will save us? Well, with that in mind, those things in mind, let's consider this brief genealogy before us. With, with the exceptions of Enoch and Lamech, there is nothing said about the other three names in this genealogy of Cain. Now, this is likely in part to distinguish the Enoch and Lamech in this genealogy from the Enoch and the Lamech whom we will meet in chapter 5 in Seth's genealogy. Lamech is the seventh from Adam, and, uh, and, and so he features especially prominently in, in the genealogy. Um, so for him, it's at least a little bit more than simply identifying him as, as the other Lamech. Now, verses 17 to 18, while nothing really is said about the character of most of these men, their inclusion in this genealogy, especially being sandwiched in between Cain and Lamech, it certainly doesn't bode well for them. It may indeed be unnecessary to conclude that every single person mentioned in Cain's line or every person that existed in Cain's line had to be a wicked, godless unbeliever. But whatever the case with many of the sons of Cain, or even one or a few of the sons of Cain, we are given explicit details about the last of these men here, Lamech. And there are three things that we need to note about him. He's sexually perverse, he's extremely violent, and he is blasphemously arrogant. So we see a sexual perversion first. The narrative interjects and ends this genealogy uh, essentially by telling us that he takes for himself two wives, Ada and Zillah. Now, the text uh, here certainly doesn't explicitly condemn polygamy, but it does not shed a favorable light on it in the least. You'll recall that the man and the woman created and placed in the garden had been created to engage in a monogamous union. It was to be just the two of them in their marriage relationship. And, and in light of that reality, while there are godly men in the Old Testament who engage in the act of polygamy, it is surely no coincidence that the first polygamist in the Bible is this man before us today, Lamech, who is unquestionably of a seedy character. Lamech's taking of two wives, this proto prototypical act of polygamy, is, is set before us as an indication of his wicked character. Even the names of his wives seem to give some indication of the kind of man that he was. Ada means something like ornament. Zillah means something like a sweet sound. And, and so it seems to be an indication that he's a man obsessed with outward beauty and and sensual pleasure. We're then told that Ada bears two sons to Lamech, Jabal, the father of tent dwellers, and Jubal, the father of musicians. And then Zillah bears two children to Lamech as well. One, a son, Tubal Cain, father of uh, those who forage for uh, bronze and iron, and a daughter. We're not told anything else 
about the daughter, but her name means lovely one. And so, likewise, it seems to be further confirmation of the kinds of things that Lamech finds important in the women in his life. So he's sexually perverse, but he's also extremely violent. He tells his two wives that he killed a man for wounding him, a young man for striking him. Now, it's unclear what the offense of the young man was, but Lamech seems to consider his own response rather disproportionate, and he's quite proud of it. The man wounded me, and now he's dead. I've wondered about the significance of his audience. This song of the sword, why does he sing it to his wives? Perhaps he's building on the threat of conflict from Genesis 3.16. Maybe that judgment oracle was well known. And so, in other words, he says, Ada, Zilla, listen up. You might be tempted to resist me at some point, to frustrate my leadership over you. Mark it well. I've killed a man for less. So he's a violent man. And he's an arrogant and a blasphemous man, thirdly. Because whatever hope he, he ho whatever he hoped to affect in his wives, he goes on and declares in that song that if Cain's revenge was sevenfold, Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. Now we've noted Lamech was the seventh descendant mentioned from Adam through Cain. And so it, he's building on this theme, and he says that if Cain's revenge is sevenfold, his will be seventy-sevenfold. Seven is a number in Scripture that often represents perfect completion. And so uh, he squares it, sort of. He, he perfectly completes the perfectly complete vengeance of Cain. If somebody strikes Cain, then God will repay him sevenfold. And so he takes upon himself this divine protection without a word of such protection from the Lord and says, and if you, if you strike me, then you will receive a 77-fold punishment. He sees himself as the climax, the pinnacle of Cain's legacy. No one should be stupid enough to mess with him. Right? There, there is a, a, a co-opting that takes place here. God had in some very real regard that even if it remains a mystery how, why or how he places this mark on Cain, he had mercifully provided for the continued existence of humanity by not allowing this murderer to be murdered. God does that and so Lamech takes that, this self-worshipper, and he co-ops it and he, and he gives it to himself. And so... This genealogy, it tells us that all the hopes of Adam and Eve in their firstborn, it's clear beyond a doubt, those hopes must lie elsewhere. Not only did Cain murder Abel, but the, the, the pinnacle of his lineage comes to us in Lamech, the seventh from Adam through Cain. This man is violent, a God-defying polygamist. Now, before we move on to verses 25 and 26, I, I want to make a few observations about the man's sons uh, very briefly, and then I want to come back to them at the end. But Lamech's children, um, his sons in particular, were told they made great expansions uh, and developments in culture. Jabal and his descendants take up the work of, of shepherding. Um, Jubal makes music, Tubal Cain, uh, metallurgy, I think you would call it. And so it's very interesting because sandwiched in between Lamech's sexual perversion and his blasphemous murder and arrogant boasting, we see in between those two things in verse 20 and 21, verses 20 and 21, um, we see that Although the line of Adam's first son, Cain, culminates in this wicked man, this line, nevertheless, 
is carried along under what theologians have called the common grace of God. Yes, Cain is exiled from Eden. He's marked as a, a criminal, though protected from being executed. His genealogy culminates in a violent, sexually perverse blasphemer. And yet, Cain is permitted to build a city, even if it is in explicit defiance of God's curse upon him. And his descendants, through Lamech of all people, are permitted to grow in knowledge of God's world and how to use the materials of that world for the advancement of human civilization and culture. And so I just want to mark that now as, as something to consider, and then we'll come back to it at the end, that, that these sons, it's a surprising sort of turn of events, what, what we see in them and in their children, uh, but it should lead us to thanksgiving to God. But I want to press on to verses 25 and, and 26 in the, in the second place here, where God appoints another in the place of slain Abel. We saw last week that Eve had misplaced, you might say, great hope in Cain. It was misplaced because in a quick succession of wicked choices by Cain, she lost both Cain and Abel. And yet her faith in the Lord seems to persist here in verses 25 and 26. But there is a subtle shift that I think is significant and worth mentioning. In Genesis 4.1, when we're told that she bears, conceives and bears Cain, um, naming him, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Uh, this, we said, that was likely an indication that she viewed Cain somehow as a fulfillment of the promise of Genesis 3.15. But here in 4.25, when she says, God appointed her another in the place of Abel, whom Cain murdered, she uses the word not, she doesn't say, I have gotten a man by the help of the Lord, but she says, God has appointed me a seed, an offspring. She had gotten a man before, but now she had been appointed a seed. And so Eve had hoped for Cain. But the text wants us to see that it is Seth, not Cain, that is the seed. And we'll see this confirmed through the rest of Genesis and the rest of Scripture. It is through Seth's line that the seed, capital S, will ultimately come. And we're told that Seth fathers a son. Enosh. And then we're given this peculiar phrase in verse 26. The end of verse 26. At that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. Now, admittedly, there is quite a bit of debate, it seems, about exactly how this statement is meant to be taken. Uh, I don't think it's necessary to go into to all of that. Uh, essentially, I, I think being overly precise and dogmatic about the verse may be difficult, but I think it's best to read it as a reference to a renewal of formal public corporate worship that had in some way began at least privately with Abel uh, being corrupted by Cain. And so it's, it's, it's not necessarily, though, that Right, people before Enosh didn't know the Lord's name or that no one had faith, but there is a, a sense in which uh, worship, corporate worship is being established here clearly through people, and it's being clearly associated with Seth's lineage. And so we're meant to contrast the line of Seth with the line of Cain. We have, we're about to give, get, be given a much fuller genealogy of Adam through Seth in chapter 5. And we have the beginning of it here. And so we have two genealogies here at the end of Genesis 4. And, and so um, while I, I think it would be reading into the text something that isn't there to assume that every single one of Cain's descendants was wicked, godless unbeliever and that every single one of Seth's descendants was righteous, uh, we are very clearly meant to see these two lines, these two lineages in 
contrast. Two families, one associated with violence, arrogance, sexual perversion, with Lamech as the, the pinnacle of it, the other associated with the worship of the one true God. And so I want us to consider what lessons we can draw from all of this. First, we must see how sin multiplies and mutates in the world. Previously, thinking back to Genesis 3, we saw that when Adam and Eve sinned, what did they do? They immediately felt guilty. They felt ashamed. They covered themselves. They hid themselves. And then, ultimately, when confronted about their sins, they confessed to the Lord. Last week, we saw that one... <laughs> generation down with Cain, when he sinned, we're not told precisely what he thought or felt about the murder of his brother, but when he was confer confronted about it, what did he do? He lied blatantly to God's face, and then he protested his punishment in exclusive self-interest. He, he didn't care about his dead brother, his grieving parents. He was only worried about himself, and he wasn't willing to accept whatever it was that God would send his way in terms of judgment. And then several generations later with Lamech, we see he neither hides his sins, he neither makes no attempt to cover them up, he doesn't even lie about them. He writes a song about it. Sin has come into the world. It's wreaking havoc. It's multiplying and mutating and corroding and corrupting everything that it can. By the time we get to the end of Genesis 4, and, and this will only, we will continue to see how this works in the coming chapters. Unchecked sin will grow and multiply. Therefore, as an application for us, it will grow and multiply in your life, left unchecked, undealt with. Not just your lives, brothers, sisters, but the lives of your children, the lives of our posterity. We see this in civilizations today. What one generation believes and holds dear, the next one takes for granted, and then the next one forgets or they reject it. I forget how that thing goes. You know what I'm talking about. But as the generations go, the things that you hold dear now might not care about 75 years down the road. And so we need to see that. We need to be on guard against that. But a second thing and application to make here is this. Uh, to which city do you belong? To which line do you belong? Which family do you belong? The city of man or the city of God? Right? Cain, broadly, and his family represents the city of man. Seth, broadly, represents the city of God. One, as I said, marked by violence, sexual perversion, and pride. But what else? Think about Lamech's sons. There's a focus on the here and now, making life better through technological advancements. The other city, the other family, is marked by faith, with a focus on, on, on what? Uh, the, as it were, the there and later, right? They, there's a recommitment at the time of Enosh's birth to the public worship of God. And so to which city do you belong? Where are you living? Are you living your best life now? Or are you living for the life that is to come? Now, I, I want to be careful here not to be misunderstood and this is where we'll kind of bring back in Lamech sons. Because what I don't mean is that we as Christians should utterly reject the things of earth as useless and evil. Right? Some, some read this passage, verses 20 and following, and, and they, they conclude, Aha! Science! The arts, culture, civilization, technology, they all owe their origins to wicked men, to secular society, to Cain and his line through Lamech. 
so Christians should avoid them. But I think it's a serious mistake to draw such a conclusion. Uh, for one, Genesis, in mentioning Lamech's sons as the founders of certain cultural achievements, Genesis doesn't tell us that civilization and culture belong to the godless. What I mean is that while some trades and cultural developments are described here as originating with those in Cain's line, we would be wrong to conclude that all trades and cultural development originated with Cain and his line. Or even that those developments here originating with them belong to them in some type of proprietary sense and that Christians must lay off of farming, music making, or anything to do with bronze or ironwork. But for another, given the fact that God had commanded Adam to work the ground, to cultivate it, to take dominion over the earth, the, the cultural work of Cain's line should stir our affections and our gratitude to the Lord rather than to lead us to cast aspersions on culture. Right? Are we not meant to see that these individuals... These three sons of Lamech, despite the fact that they almost certainly did not fear God any more than their father did, is it not wild that they are permitted to meaningfully develop aspects of civilization, science, art, and culture? In other words, doesn't God make it rain and shine on the just and the unjust? Isn't God exceptionally kind to the world? And so unbelievers, as well as believers, can discover true things about God's world. Now, unbelievers won't know how to interpret what they discover in light of ultimate reality because they deny ultimate reality. But that doesn't mean that the unbeliever's observations about the world have to be completely wrong all the time. So we would do well to listen and to make sure that they aren't saying or seeing something that we should say even better. But we're, we're helped here as well as we consider how these particular vocations of, of the sons of Lamech how they are ultimately reclaimed by God's people, in particular for the worship of Yahweh. So, uh, a thought exercise here. Uh, what do Jabal's tent-dwelling shepherd children remind you of? Is it not, perhaps, the tabernacle and the tents in which Israel dwelt under God's direction in their wanderings? And when Jacob and his sons come to dwell in Egypt at the end of Genesis, Genesis 46, 34, what is their profession? Why can't they live amongst the Egyptians in close proximity or have dinner with them? Because they are shepherds, keepers of livestock. What about Jubal's sons, the musicians? Is the Bible not filled with music and song? Don't we have two whole books at least dedicated entirely to song? The book of Psalms and the song of songs. Lamentations even is a song of lament. What about Tubal Cain's descendants, those who forged bronze and iron? Well, I want to consider those in, those in two different directions. On the one hand, you can read in Joshua 6 about Israel's battle with the wicked inhabitants of the city of Ai. Uh, God commanded Israel to make an utter destruction of the place, but all the silver and every vessel and bronze and iron were, were holy to the Lord. Bronze and iron, holy to the Lord. They were going to the treasury of the Lord. Similarly, in, in 1 Chronicles 22, 14 and following, David says in making preparations for his son Solomon to build the temple of the Lord, this is what he says, With great pains I have provided for the house of the Lord a hundred thousand talents of gold, 
a million talents of silver, and bronze and iron beyond weighing, for there is so much of it. Timber and stone, too, I have provided. To these you must add, you have an abundance of workmen, stone cutters, masons, carpenters, and all kinds of craftsmen without numbers, skilled in working gold, silver, bronze, and iron. Arise and work, the Lord be with you. If God's people are meant to reject the things that Lamech's sons developed, no one told David. But on the other hand, Psalm 107, rejoicing in God's deliverance of his people, gives thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love, saying, For your wondrous works, uh, so it gives thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man, saying this, The Lord shatters the doors of bronze, and he cuts in two the bars of iron. Likewise, in Isaiah 45, 2 and following, the Lord tells Cyrus that he will go before him, leveling the exalted places, breaking in pieces the doors of bronze and cutting through the bars of iron. So, the Lord was pleased to allow bronze and iron into his treasury to be used in the building of the tabernacle, but when all is said and done, there is no earthly material, no technological advancement that can withstand the power of of God. And so, while we should not reject technological advancements outright, neither should we place all our hope in them. Now, there may be some technologies that we should reject, but that's a different sermon altogether. For the most part, however, the right course of action seems to be to ask, how might I, how may I make use of this thing for the glory of God, for the good of others, for the advancement of God's kingdom in the world, and then get to work putting it to such uses? Now, by this, and by this, this reclaiming and retooling I, language that we see, I don't mean that we should slap Christian bumper stickers on everything the secular world creates, calling it Christian. We should be developing and creating things ourselves. But we can take cues from the Bible in that while these particular cultural uh, advancements were attributed to Cain's line, they're being repurposed by the Lord's people. But finally, we need to come to Jesus Christ. Because all of these things cohere in a pretty satisfying way in the Lord Jesus. So again, think about what we're discussing. And see if this description of Jesus resonates with anything you hear in this passage. Jesus is the true Israelite who is the good shepherd in John 10. The good shepherd who in John 1, we're told, had tabernacled among us. He is the one to whom the Father promised, what? A rod of iron in Psalm 2 to rule the nations. He receives such a rod and wields it in Revelation 19, treading down the wicked under his feet, which had been described as burnished bronze in Revelation 1. And he is the one to whom the four living creatures in Revelation, along with the elders, the angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands uh, upon thousands, along with every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth, we will sing to him, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever. And so... Genesis 4 tells us, indeed, sin has and is spreading. Wicked Cain and his line um, were flourishing. But this first major section of Genesis ends with a note of hope. The public worship of God has formally recommenced, and it shall continue until the earth is full of the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. And we have the great privilege now to make use of God's world and to identify ourselves primarily as worshipers of God who 
to whom, through Jesus Christ, in him, we shall inherit the earth. 